Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I am very happy this evening that God has brought us together to worship the Lord and also to hear God's word. And I am very much happy to introduce a very, very young, growing preacher. I should say that this evening. Well, a wonderful man of God, I should define in that way. Passionate, passionate for the people in many ways. You may be thinking, of course, he hasn't gone through theological training, but why? And I found him, there is a call of God. He has a call of God, and I'm sure that if the Lord tarries, God is going to use him in different parts of the continent of this world. I'm sure about that, and we're going to see that. So, I must say that, well, a wonderful, you are going to hear it. I'm sure the Lord is going to use him, a special anointing is on him. That's what. And also, I should say that he follows his father's footprint. And always God honors a person, one who follows the father. And even Jesus Christ actually did the will of his father. And so that's what I found him. In another word, I may say that he's not a very well-known preacher, but his life is a preaching. That's what exactly what I am. I am in ASL and I see. And really, his life is a message for all you young people. So that made me just a few weeks before, just to bring him to uh, the stage and so that what is in his heart, what the Lord is going to speak to us through his heart. And so I just want all of you to open your video and see him, encourage him, listen to the word of God, and give him, I should say that, a signal of your happiness, uh, which is on your mobile. So he's none other than Aaron Rafia Sedia, a wonderful man of God. So let us welcome, I on the behalf of ASL, welcome Aaron Rafia Sedia for this evening share God's word. Let's give a good hand to him. Yes, the time is given to you. Let's take over the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful um, introduction. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm so thankful and grateful uh, for being here. I'd like to thank God, Rajwargi, sir, Napoleon, sir, and all our uh, key uh, administrators of ASL. And I thank you for this time. So today, I'd like to share some things from a story. And um, before going into the story, I would like to read some verses, which are from Mark chapter 12, 13 to 31, which says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. And when I say these verses, I think all of us see the bigger picture that I'm talking about the Good Samaritan. So today we're going to look from the story of the Good Samaritan and it's a well-known story. All of us uh, have heard it before, but today this is, the, uh, this is the story that I'm going to share from. So the Good Samaritan is a story in which Jesus is approached by an expert in the law who asked Jesus a question. And Jesus, to, uh, in order to answer him, tells him to go back to the word and read. And when the speaker of the law hears this, he says that uh, he thinks that no, this should not happen. So he asks another question and Jesus tells him a story. So I'd like to read it once. This, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan is written in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, I think. So let's read it. Um, I'm reading the NLT version, so uh, let's read. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him the question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, 
Jesus told him, do this and you, uh, and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And we move on to read, Jesus replied with the story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped off his him off his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion on him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill uh, runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So this is the word of God that I'm going to share from today and is placed before us. So the story of the Good Samaritan starts by the most important commandment. A uh, expert in the law comes to Jesus and asks him a question to test him. And he asks, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when I read from verses 25 to 29, I see a human nature of God, which is a sarcasm. Uh, and it was kind of funny when I read it because the, uh, the expert in the law asks the question, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, knowing that he was going to test him, didn't answer him, but he told him, uh, he asked him a question. What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And it was so funny to read because what Jesus couldn't have me uh, meant by that was, aren't you a teacher of the law? Why are you asking me what you already know? And so the man goes, uh, the man answered, when Jesus asked him what is written in the law, the man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, soul all of your strength, all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus told him, right, do this and you shall live. So Jesus, instead of answering his question, goes back to the word. He doesn't just um, answer the question. He's telling him not to stay, get out of the word, but to dwell on it. And the man wanted to justify his actions. Now, when the man, uh, the word justify has been used here, justify. So when the word justified is used, it means that someone wants to say that I'm not wrong. That means that he measured himself first. He thought that I am, am I following both of these commandments? That I'm loving the Lord with all heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loving my neighbor as myself. But because he thought that he couldn't uh, fulfill all the uh, commandments, he justified himself and asked him a question, who is my neighbor? And now what he thought here was, that I was fulfilling the first command, which was I was loving the Lord with all of my heart, soul, strength, and mind. But at that time, there was a command given to them. And that is recorded in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 5, 43 to 40, uh, 44, which says, you have heard that it, it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I tell you, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. So what happens here is uh, the definition of the word neighbor would change everything. And that he could uh, justify himself. Because what was uh, told in the law was that my neighbor are those who are my enemies. Pardon? Okay. So my neighbors are those who are my enemies. My neighbors are those who I love, like my friends, like my uh, family. 
And so he asked this question, who are my neighbors? And now Jesus. It is a very wonderful way how Jesus responds to answers. Jesus ans uh, answers the questions with stories many times and talks through stories a lot of times. And this is what happens here. So he gives us the story of the Good Samaritan and what's ha what happens here is a Jewish man. So right here before proceeding, I would like to tell you NLT is the new living. Um, yeah, so it's a new version of the Bible. And when it says a Jewish man, in the original version, in the old version, a Jewish man is not written. It's just written a man. So it's just an assumption. I won't, I can't say that it was necessarily a Jewish man, but Jesus was talking to a Jewish crowd. So it might indicate to that, to that. So it says a Jewish man was going Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, and, and he was attacked by bandits. So what is happening is a man was traveling and in middle, he was attacked by bandits. Now, let me tell you an interesting fact. The road that the Jewish man was walking with was commonly known for these things um, like robbery and stuff. And you could get uh, stolen there. But I don't know for what reason the Jewish man went, uh, went through that road. And what happens is they stripped him off his clothes, beat him and left him half dead beside the road. And now when the band bandits caught him, they beat him up, they took off their clothes and whatever he had. And they left him half dead without anything beside the road. And what happens is by chance, a priest came along. Now a priest is coming and saw the wounded man. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. And next after the priest, a temple assistant comes, also known as Levite. A Levite walked over and looked at him lying there. He also passed by on the other side. So a priest came and he left. Now a uh, Levite comes and he left as well. But then after that, a despised Samaritan came. Now the word despised has been used as um, when we talk about Jews and Samaritans, there had been a conflict between each other. They hated each other. So Jesus was talking to a Jewish crowd. So when he said despised crowd, uh, despised Samaritan, he meant that a person was coming who was Samaritan, who is despised by all these people who are listening, came along. And when he saw the man who was wounded, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put on the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him to take care of this man. If his bills run higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, what is happening is a Samaritan is coming who is hated by all these people. And when he saw the man, the wounded man, who was assumed to be a Jew, who was, who they hated each other. If the wounded man was a Jew and this person was a Samaritan, they're supposed to hate each other and not be with each other. Because um, I think all of us remember the story when Jesus went by well and a Samaritan woman was there. Even she raised the question that it is not right for us to uh, talk to each other, right? To communicate with each other. And so this is what is happening here. Normally, both of them should not uh, help, even talk to each other. But this Samaritan man helped the Jew Jewish person and hand... Uh, and soothe his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandage them. So at that time, olive oil and wine acted as antiseptics and um, healing medicines, like medicines. They helped wounds heal faster and bandage them. So he used his own resources, what he had, what he kept for himself and gave it to a man that he, he was supposed to hate. And then he took the man on his own donkey and took him in, and took him to an inn. That means when he says his own donkey, that means he had to walk himself. 
And so what he's doing here is he's using his resources. He's taking burden for himself in order for a man who is supposed, uh, who he is supposed to hate and doing everything for him to give him comfort and care. Took him to an inn. Now the word inn has been used. It is, uh, it is indicated to a hotel at that time. So he went to an hotel where he took care of him. So he took care of him for a day, not just for, he didn't just uh, hand him over to an inn or a doctor. He took care of him himself. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins. In the original words, uh, two denarius has been used. So I'll keep that in mind. So he took the, uh, took the care of the Jewish man for a day and handed the money to the um, innkeeper and told him some things which were take care of this man. That means I have to go, but take care of this man if his bill runs higher than it is, I'll pay you the next time. I'll do it. That means that if the bill is higher, if I need to pay more, then I'll come back and pay you. That means he's not just saying now the person is on his own. He's taking care of his future needs. And now the story is coming to an end. And Jesus asks, which one of the three would, would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandit? Now, uh, the Jewish uh, leader, the expert in the law says, the one who showed him mercy. Now, do you see here, the expert in the law was a Jew and he didn't even say the word Samaritan. He just said the one who showed him mercy. I'm sure if it was the priest who helped him, he would say it was the priest who helped him or the Levite. But here we see the sense of hatred between each other, the clans and the classes. So he said, the man who helped him, then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now, this is so, uh, this was an interesting story and I would like to share a few things about it. So um, let us start. So this story indicates and has a lot, a lot of things common with Jesus and what he did for us. And I see my own life in it. For example, um, I'd like to, to, before moving, before seeing the similarities, I would like to uh, put pressure on something. When, when Jesus said here, yes, now go and do the same. Did Jesus mean you should love uh, you should love like this and you should give everything for someone who you see who is in need. And so sometimes it's very confusing what this means, but I'd like to share some light on it and tell you some things. So when Jesus said uh, this, that go and go and do likewise, what Jesus meant was, first of all, this doesn't mean that running after every need that is there. After all, the Samaritan didn't start a hospital for everyone who was injured. It just means to put concern for the one before us. And both in spiritual and uh, both in social and spiritual needs. The world, uh, the world would be a changing place if every Christian attending to the sorrows that are plain before him. Said McLaren, uh, I think he was a great preacher, so he said this. And Many, even most people don't have this kind of love for others. Then how can they receive eternal life? Because the main question which the um, expert in the law asked was, how can I receive eternal life? Uh, then Jesus told him, show this kind of love, go and do likewise. But now people don't have this kind of love for others or for God. So the first thing which I want to tell you is by refusing to inherit eternal life by doing. We cannot, uh, uh, we cannot earn eternal life by doing actions and by doing anything. But the main key of, it, uh, of earning eternal life, we cannot do anything to et uh, earn eternal life. As John 3, 16 says, that for the, Lord uh, for the Lord loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life, right? That means all of us don't deserve, none of us deserve eternal life. 
we are all meant to be condemned. We were all meant to be condemned. But right here, uh, what I learned is that heaven and salvation is not something that can be earned, but it's a gift. So you cannot earn eternal life by doing something, but by believing in Christ, trusting in God, and knowing that Jesus paid the penalt penalty that we deserve every time we have fallen short of loving God and of loving others the way we should have. And uh, one more thing that I want to tell is, let it, uh, let it not be forgotten, forgotten that the Lord demands us to bear fruit, not just to read, but to bear fruit of what it wants us to, what it, what it means to us. When we read the gospel, when we read the law and we read the gospel, we should share the gospel and it should grow, produce fruit in us. So those were some things that I wanted, uh, I wanted to share before going into similarities. And I would like to share, share some similarities between the Samaritan and Jesus. So the Samaritan was an outsider despised by many. We know that Jesus was an outsider as well and was despised by, despised by all. The Samaritan came uh, after others failed to meet the needs. In the Bible, when we read, all of us failed to meet, all of the characters failed to meet the needs of God and had fallen short in some way or the other. When you take even the best guy, the man after God's own heart, they all failed in certain levels. And then the Samaritan came before it was too late. So the Samaritan came with everything necessary. The Samaritan came right to the afflicted man. The Samaritan gave tender care. The Samaritan provided for future needs. And so when I look at these things, all of these things, I look at my own life. And when I put the Samaritan, I put Jesus in the place of Samaritan, I see myself. Because when I was... Uh, when I was in sin, I was dead and I was half dead right there. Jesus came there, even though he was an outsider despised by many, he came to save me. He came, he came to uh, meet the need that other failed to meet. I wasn't able to uh, see God. I wasn't able to reunite with him, but because of Jesus, I was able to meet with Jesus and I'm able, and I am able to be with all of you. Je uh, the, some, Jesus came before it was too late. In my life, when I was, whenever I think that I, if I had known Jesus, how would my life turn out? How would I be? But whenever I think about it, I just think that Jesus came right at the perfect time. He was never late. So there is no question that I cannot think like, um, I, if I wouldn't have been saved, how would I be? I need to know that the Lord will be there in the perfect time and will always be there to take care of me. Then the Samaritan came with everything necessary. And now this is uh, what we need to learn and uh, understand. Whatever the Lord gives us is necessary for us. And what we need more is just our selfishness, which... Uh, wants us to one more. So the, the Jesus came with everything that was necessary for me to save me. Jesus came right to the afflicted man. Jesus did not uh, run around the bush finding me. He came right to me. He didn't tell, uh, he didn't call 10 people to save me. He came right to me through his word. Then the Samaritan gave tender care. This is an important point, and the Lord always gives, gives tender care. And, and I think all of us have experienced it in our lives. The Samaritan provided for future needs. The Lord right now has given us all that we needed, but doesn't just stop there. He provides our future needs and takes care of the future needs that we have. And these were some things that I, uh, I had a testimony that I had to share. And these were the things which helped me believe in Christ and ma made me the person who I am today. 
And so uh, the things which I wanted to share today was it is impossible to love like Christ because we cannot love like Christ because he loves us unconditionally. In Greek, the word agape has been used, which means unconditional love. No matter what you do, he will love you back. It is not a selfish love that because you did this, I love you. Because you did this, I'll hate you. But he loves us no matter what we do. And the second one is, we cannot love like Christ, but we can live, uh, reflect his love through our lives. And what that means is, uh, when Jesus said, go and do like us in the story, Jesus allowed the parable to answer the lawyer's question and guide the application. I am to love the neighbor, and my neighbor is the one uh, who, who might be considered my enemy. My neighbor is the one who is with the need right in front of me. The lawyer, the lawyer now knew that he couldn't justify himself, that he couldn't have that kind of love, a love that went beyond what he could call off as neighbor. So if he couldn't love like that, like the way he should have loved, and we cannot love like God. How can we reflect God's love? And these are just some simple things that I'd say that we can do to reflect God's love. And um, so sometime before I met a pastor who told me that it doesn't just necessarily mean that you should be a pastor to glorify God's name and to show his love. You can show God's love in everything that you do while working in your, in your office, while cleaning, while singing, while studying. You can do any, everything. You can show God's love in everything while doing everything. And these are some short, uh, small steps that we can do to show his love. Show God's love by listening. Sometimes in our life, uh, listening is the best key and not um, to heal someone. It is sometimes very hard to just listen to someone, but it is the best medicine to heal someone. Instead of just telling him what to do, what he should do, just listening to one uh, once heals them. And it can reflects, reflect God's love, that warmth that God has. Show God's love with generosity. And it, ju it doesn't just mean financially. It can be uh, spiritually, it can be with words, it can be with actions. Sometimes generosity doesn't just mean money. Generous, being generous with words and just being so kind to that person and helping him can also be a key medicine of showing God's love. And uh, the other is showing God's love by encouraging. Now, uh, when people have burden, a simple words of encouragement can lift them up, can help them feel a warmth, which, uh, which can show them God's love. And the, uh, one of the main keys that all of us do is showing God's love by praying for others. Sometimes prayer is the biggest answer for everything and can help and is the biggest um, solution. And uh, the last one is showing God's love with the act of kindness. Selfless love comes from God. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love is not self-seeking. When you love someone, you, you, it, it is not something that, from the Bible, it is not something that should be self-seeking. It is not that should be revolve around, uh, revolving around ourselves. Just because uh, you did something, I love you but it should be something that is reflecting his love, what he has shown to us. So not just doing actions, but praying for others, uh, being kind to others by encouraging, gener being generous are some ways we can uh, reflect God's love. And in the story, we, he said that we know that he's coming back to pay. It said that if his bill runs higher, I will come back and pay him. That means he's not just stopping there. He's coming back. And uh, we need to know that Jesus is coming back. So we need to wait on him and uh, be there with patience and with faith and stand there. And lastly, the thing that I wanted to share is 
did the story end right there? For the story, Good Samaritan, we know the parable, it ended there when Jesus said, yes, go now do the same. But when we put ourselves in the story that Jesus came for us, saved us, and uh, is coming back, we need to know that the story didn't end there for us. We have everlasting more to come. That means Jesus is going to come back and we will be with him forever and ever. Let our story not just end uh, by Jesus going away and he's going, let us not, our story not just end there when we were sad and we were hopeless, when we were healing and Jesus went and is going to come back. But let our story be in such a way that when Jesus helped us, we go back to him and praise him. The thing what I love about churches and going to churches is that I'm not going there by force. It is by my own will that I'm going to praise the Lord. And it is not just something that is a formality, but it is something that I choose to do. And that is what I wanted to share today. That is God's love is something that is amazing. And it is something all of us need to feel in our lives. It is not something that only us uh, Christian believers should feel, but it is something that everyone, every child of Christ should uh, experience in their lives. And as we had seen, we had seen the similarities between uh, the Samar Samaritan and Jesus. We need to remember that he is never late. He is always on time. And he has everything necessary to meet our needs and to tend to our present needs. And that he, he gives tender care and that he doesn't only care for us now, he will care for us in the future and will provide us uh, with what we need in the future. So praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you for um, allowing me to come here today and share from the word of God. I'm really grateful. Thank you, everyone. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. It is a powerful uh, message we have heard today from the story of Samaritans. And then I would say it again, that he's just a teenage and 16 and then bringing a powerful message from the word of God. I hope that the Lord will 